from the News Channel 5 Network. This is Open Line. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Open Line. Glad you're with us. We're talking about construction in Nashville. It has been booming. There's no doubt about it, even during the pandemic. But how safe are those workplaces? There is a new bill that is in the uh, Metro Council that will make workplace safety a major priority. It could bring about some major changes on Metro construction sites. So that's what we want to talk about tonight. How are workers impacted by the current way things are done? And how could things be improved? We have two people with us who can talk more in depth about this very important topic. We have Ethan Link. He has been with us before via Zoom. He is the assistant business manager for the Southeast Laborers. Ethan, thank you for being with us. Yeah. And we have a Metro Councilwoman, Sandra Sepulveda. She is Councilwoman for District 30. She is a sponsor of this bill. Thank you very much for being with us as well. Yes, thank you for inviting me. So, Ethan, we've done a, I've, I've done a few stories on this, but but big picture, what is the need? Um, what, what is the current situation on construction sites right now in Nashville? Absolutely, Ben. Well, since 2017, there have been uh, 21 workplace deaths here in Davidson County, most of them in construction. And uh, that compares to a lot of our peer cities like Austin, Minneapolis, Charlotte, Memphis, where that number is half. Uh, so we have a one of the most deadly cities in the South for construction workers specifically. And we've seen that play out uh, multiple times and it, it's happening at a greater frequency than ever. Um, and particularly, we've seen some uh, really tragic examples uh, over the last year um, that really uh, inspired us to um, really put our nose to the grindstone and find uh, the best solutions we could to move the ball forward in, in Nashville on uh, construction safety. Um, the problem a lot of times becomes that uh, the standards that uh, are being used are getting lower and lower as contractors are having a harder and harder time finding qualified trained workers. Uh, so they resort to less and less formal um, workplace agreements uh, and that causes them to wind up with less training, uh, less awareness of who the contractors they're working with are and uh, frequently results in miscommunication and uh, unfortunately fatalities. So the uh, safety so is looking... one issue. And then the That's other right. issue is um, workers being basically ripped off. I is that right? Absolutely, they're linked uh, very closely by the use of multi-tiered subcontracting. Um, and that causes a lot of the problems that we're seeing in the industry. And we know with just a little bit of leadership, Metro could not only be sure that its jobs are the safest, but it could actually use its uh, position as the largest purchaser of construction services in the county uh, in order to guide the entire market towards safer and better practices. And so, Councilwoman, um, what, what, what can be done? What, what, is the, what, are, what are you trying to do, I guess, with this bill? Yeah, so we have uh, proposed legislation uh, to reform the way we handle procurement. Um, we want to incentivize good contractors and, and people who are going to do right by their workers. And we're aiming to change the standards and the way things are done in this city. So we're going to reward people who have OSHA training. We're going to reward people who uh, don't commit wage theft and who haven't had any major uh, OSHA violation and uh, we're going to make sure that um, we're looking out for our people. Um, we're also going to change hopefully the the makeup of the procurement board to include a labor voice and to include a voice from the community. Um, this way we make things more transparent because we, we can't afford to lose more people on construction sites. It's just it's not fair to the people who are building this city. And uh, before I get more into the detail of this, this has several sponsors. Uh, how, how confident are you that, that this will pass? I mean, kind of where is it in the process and, and what, what are your thoughts about its success? 
Yeah, we, we, we do have several sponsors, several sponsors who dip, uh, represent different aspects of this city. So uh, we are reaching across aisles and uh, we, we, are, we are working hard to make sure that we have enough, enough council members to sign on to, to pass this legislation. And so we just finished first reading um, and, and second reading is scheduled for the next uh, council meeting, but um, we're we're getting there. You know, we, we, it, it's quite a few sponsors, and Ethan and several of the other labor groups and worker groups have been uh, working hard to uh, have meetings with all the council members. Since I'm unable to because of Sunshine Law, and uh, uh, Ethan, you know, we're we're getting pretty close, right? Absolutely, um, we've got um, I not been able to check with the metro clerk today but um i know um uh, earlier this week we had 18 sponsors um which is very close to the 21 that you need to pass legislation and we're finding a lot of council people are responding uh, really positively they're saying this is common sense and um it is a follow-up to uh, what a lot of the hard work that has been done um, with this very progressive, very uh, worker-friendly Metro Council by Stand Up Nashville, uh, the uh, umbrella group that brings together uh, labor and immigrant and civil rights groups um, to uh, really promote our all collective interests on the Metro Council. Um, and we've seen great success by bringing those perspectives together that we are able to unite um, a great coalition of leaders here in Davidson County. Is there concern, obviously we're booming, the city's booming, there's been a lot of construction even during COVID. Is there concern that if there is more regulation, um, that it could slow that down somehow? Um, and, and I'm trying to think of you know the arguments against this, that, that it could slow it down, that, that labor is already very hard to find. If more regulation is put on there, then it might make labor even more hard to find. I guess, are those some of the things you're hearing in opposition? And, and what about those specifically? And, and then what are you hearing in opposition? Well, and that's something that's so important about the way that we're approaching this, is it is not primarily a regulatory approach. It's primarily an incentive-based approach. And so what we do is we say Metro is going to seek out the contractors who do the most to invest in training and invest in workforce development and apprenticeship. And what that does is, you know, no single contractor always has the best interest to um, train a bunch of folks that may be going to work for their competition the next day. Uh, but what it does is it creates a race to the top where whoever does the best training and the most consistent training is going to get the most opportunity. And that will mean that at the end of the day, uh, multiple contractors doing more and more training uh, results in solving that workforce shortage rather than uh, contributing to it. Okay. What are some specific examples um, that kind of stick out over the last year or so, or even before COVID, I guess? What, what are some specific examples that really point to the need for this? And, and yep. Councilwoman, I'll let, I'll let you address that. Yeah, so this past summer, we had a, uh, a gentleman who was 16 years old. Uh, his name is uh, was Gustavo, and um, he fell. He fell here in our city to his death. Uh, he was on a construction site. He didn't have the per, um, the required um, safety equipment that he needed, and he fell. And he didn't come home that day. And we, when we had our press conference announcing this legislation, that was supposed to be his 17th birthday. And it's unacceptable for us to continue to have people that that die while while building our city. And so we want to make sure that we protect people like Gustavo, that uh, we make sure that there we have the proper equipment and that we're doing work with contractors who are going to be responsible and um, that we're creating this this paper trail so we could also get in contact with the subcontractors because it was very difficult to get in contact with them after this occurred and 
No one wants to be responsible when something bad happens. And so with this legislation that would create a contract for every subcontractor, uh, that we would have protection for our workers. And that's why this legislation is dire and it needs to happen now. And it should have happened before. And maybe we could have saved people like Gustavo, but we're here right now. We have the council we need to get this passed. And we're gonna keep trying to make sure that we protect people just like him. And so how would this bill, how would this legislation have made a difference in that case you just mentioned? How would it have stopped an untrained 16 year old from getting on a construction site? Yeah, so so we in, in, our, in the legislation, we incentivize OSHA training uh, and apprenticeship programs. And programs like this that would teach workers safety measures would have protected Gustavo. And I would add, Ben, that I would add, Ben, that the other thing that makes that uh, important is that uh, the fact that Gustavo died on this project uh, w will not be held against the general contractor uh, were they to seek uh, a job with Metro government. And so um, under this bill, uh, his death would uh, at least be um, something that would count against them when they were seeking Metro work, which means that their work in the commercial sector uh, would be as important to them from a safety standpoint as their work when they're doing business with our city. So they would be very careful and not cut corners uh, that would lead to some of these accidents. If they knew their safety record would follow them when they were looking for a metro contract, it would incentivize them to not have workplace accidents, I guess. Is, is that kind of the essence of this? Absolutely. And we've seen those lower standards that used to be, um, you know, used to you only saw it in, you know, apartment construction or uh, residential construction. We've seen the standards go down in commercial. We've seen them go down in larger commercial, like the job that Gustavo was on. And now we even see those same uh, accidents happen on metro projects. And uh, I think I sent this to you last night, Ben, that um, we had been saying that there had not been a fatality on a metro project for a certain amount of time. Well, that changed yesterday when a 70-year-old, 71-year-old uh, man um, was doing traffic control and was crushed by a bulldozer. Um, that happened just yesterday in East Nashville. Mm. Yeah, and so that, um, again, it, it speaks to the need for this. Now, as I've done some stories about wage theft and, and some of this, Part of what I found is that you have obviously a general contractor who's way up here and is in charge of the project, then you have subcontractors, many subcontractors. And many times if, if there is someone who is um, injured uh, or not paid properly, the general contractor says, that's not me, you know, that's the subcontractor. And you can't hold me responsible up here as the general contractor, that's this other little subcontractor. How do, is that, is that, am I kind of accurately saying that? And how do you get around that? Yeah, and that's why we included a requirement to, to, for them to have contracts with their subcontractor, right? And, and, and if their subcontractors aren't paying uh, their workers, then that would also count against them when it came to uh, their bids at procurement. Um, we want to make sure that the workers have a written document that they could go back to and point to and say, you promised you were going to pay me. Here it is in writing. You have to pay me now. And did I state that right also, Ethan, about the, is that a tough thing to get around when you have this kind of layer of deniability or the, the general contractor up here and then the subcontractors, they blame them? Yeah, a absolutely. And, um, and furthermore, it becomes a real challenge for those workers and their families when they try to seek, uh, when they try to seek and be made whole in, in the courts. Um, if they don't have that uh, contract that the council member was uh, so clearly stating that that is so important. Uh, if they don't have the respect that you get from getting a clear contract that says you were promised something real and your life matters um, to uh, this business transaction, um, when they don't have that, a court finds it very difficult to award them damages or to resolve a pay dispute. Um, and so 
they uh, often are taken advantage of in that way. And we know that the folks who are denied those contracts are primarily black and brown workers and workers who've been, uh, you know, who've had a record, workers who have been, for one reason or another, uh, contractors sometimes target uh, as opportunities to take advantage. What has the response been? Because again, general contractors are, they're making massive amounts of money. They're very powerful. And I wouldn't think they would, they would like this. I wouldn't, I wouldn't think they'd want to change much of what's happening right now. And, and in fact, it hasn't changed for a long time. This, some of this stuff has been known for a long time. And, and frankly, it hasn't changed for a long time. So there's a bill like this on the table. And I'll ask you, Councilwoman, what sort of pushback are you getting from big general contractors? No, yeah, we're, we're seeing pushback right now at the state level, um, you know, trying to uh, amend current legislation to to make sure that they preempt us at the local level. You know, the, the state the state mm -hmm. always wants to uh, leave things at the local at the local level until it, it's not convenient for them. My question to contractors would be, why is this a bad thing, right? Why are they afraid um, of safety standards? Why are they afraid of having contracts with all subcontractors? Why is that something they're afraid of? And not all contractors are this way. There are good uh, contractors who work well with uh, all levels of subcontractors and all workers. You know, we want to do business with them. We want to bring them to the table. We want to bring uh, more minority contractors and more women-owned contractors. We, we want to make sure that we have that connection for them so that they feel confident that they can bid for contracts at the metro level. Um, we shouldn't be afraid of this. They shouldn't be afraid of this. And we should be doing right by our workers. They are the ones that um, are making sure that everything is running and cities are getting built. And um, this this doesn't only affect us at the, at the local Davidson County level. What they're trying to do can affect people all across the state. And we need to be aware of that. So that's interesting, the pushback you're not necessarily seeing pushback in the Metro Council where this bill is, but you are seeing, uh, I guess some contractors go straight to the state, to the legislature, and they would prevent you from enacting this potentially? Is that, is that right? That's right. I, I, they see the writing on the wall. They see the makeup of the council and they see how many council members have signed on and have expressed support. All signs point that this will get passed at the council level. So if they can't get what they want at our level, they're gonna go to the state uh, because the state has a history of preempting uh, the counties and, and, and that's the route that they're going to go towards. You know, that, that's what they're used to, but they know what we are saying at the council level. They know where this, this city is and where this county is and they know what we want and what we need. Wow, and so Ethan, what are you hearing on the state side? Yeah, you know, that this has uh, been so consistent and sad, a sad trend that uh, we find that, um, that instead of trying to collaborate and come into the conversation about how to prevent deaths of 16 year olds, how to prevent the deaths of temporary workers and, um, and subcontractors and um, address all these issues, instead of address those issues, um, we've seen contractor groups that represent uh, the lowest road contractors run to the state and um, try to rig the system against workers yet again. Um, they've done it before uh, and they continue to use that as their uh, cheapest, um, uh, quickest way to get any job done, which is what low road contractors do on their job sites. And so uh, we're gonna continue to labor uh, we're going to continue to build uh, this city and continue to do everything we can to move the uh, ball forward for worker safety and worker rights, no matter what the state does and no matter what the lowest road contractors choose uh, to do. Because at the end of the day, these are city contracts that are funded by taxpayer money. And that is not 
uh, uh, no contractor is entitled to your taxpayer money. And what they do with that money is done in our names. It's done to workers in our names when we pay our taxes. And so I think that we all should be concerned about that. And we should frankly, um, you know, make sure that the cities, uh, not just Nashville, but all cities um, unite and assert their independence to take care of their own people. We are seeing this more often from the state and, and what the state will say is some version of um, Nashville is, is a little radical, a little out there, and, and they're passing some things that, you know, we've got to rein them in. So how unusual is this bill that you're proposing? Is it in other cities? It, are we, would we be the first? Kind of what is the precedent for this? It's, it's a, the, a lot of the principles from this bill are actually modest proposals and very um, um, kind of uh, careful and incremental steps as compared to what happens in other major markets that some of the same general contractors bid work in. Um, St. Louis, for instance, has much higher standards than Nashville. And almost all of the large general contractors that operate here operate in St. Louis as well. And the workers there make more money and the workers there are safer. Um, same thing in Minneapolis. Most all of the contractors, the large general contractors that work here in Nashville work also in Minneapolis, but they work under better standards and higher with higher wages there. For some reason, they have decided that they're going to use Nashville as the low road sandbox where they try out um, the newest, lowest corner cutting measures. And unfortunately, it leaves us with less good opportunity for the money we're paying um, it, with our tax dollars. Well, that kind of sets it, the table. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Councilwoman. Yeah. Thanks. It, it, it's not radical to pay your workers. It's not radical to make sure that we have safety standards in place so we don't have one more death. Like Ethan was saying, these are modest proposals. They are basic human rights. They are basic worker rights. This isn't Nashville being radical. This is Nashville looking out for its workers. I want to get into the idea of wage theft um, and how that happens. We'll kind of detail that. We're going to take a break. That kind of sets the table for our discussion. Uh, if you want to call in, there is the number 615-737 plus 615-737-7587. If you're on the line now, hold on. Uh, we'll take your call when we come back.